Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming to this talk, which is a little bit more designy than most technical talks tend to be. Uh, yeah, as people wonder, that's cool. Uh, I'll just awkwardly get started here. Okay. Uh, hello. This talk is I love you and I don't need you. The use of color and accessible design. Uh, so, who am I? Oh <laughs> Right, uh, I don't like having my face that big in the front. Uh, so, uh, my name is Lita. I, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm an instructor at the Turing School of Software and Design in the Front End Engineering Program. Uh, we don't teach design, we're not like a UX UI program. Uh, we teach front end development, so we focus on um, JavaScript, uh, React, Redux, front end frameworks, things like that. Uh, but part of our curriculum, we do talk about one aspect of design, which is usability. Because every developer, front-end, back-end, uh, should have a good grounding in that most basic tenet of design. Uh, I'm not a designer, so thank you to everyone who is a designer who's at this talk. Thank you to everyone who is not a designer who's at this talk, uh, because I appreciate the fact that hopefully you won't know more about this than I do. I have to do a lot of research. Given that I'm not a designer and don't have a ton of background in color theory. But uh, we're going to dig into it anyway. We're going to learn that color is a lot more than just a cosmetic thing that makes our apps prettier. Um, it's actually a critical part of functionality. Before we dive in too much, I want to start with the land acknowledgement. Um, the land that this conference is taking place on um, is Sovereign Ute, Cheyenne, and Arapaho land. Indigenous peoples have been taking care of this land for centuries. They're still here and um, always will be. So let's start out by diving in to what exactly color is. Uh, it's not something we think about too often, but we can break it down into three basic pieces. Starting with hue. Hue is just what we think of when we think of colors, like red, orange, green, yellow. Uh, it's like the Crayola colors. Um, one of my favorite hues is macaroni and cheese, and <laughs> also tickle me pink. Those are my favorite crayons when I was growing up. Uh, we also have saturation. So every color, if you desaturate it, pull out the brightness, the boldness of that color, they'll eventually all turn into various shades of gray. Um, so saturation, it's anywhere from gray to the brightest, bold, pure version of that hue. We also have light or value. Um, these are created when you add white or add black to each of the colors. So when you add white, it's a tint. When you add black, it's a tone. Uh, so for example, if you take our hue of red, um, you add white, you get pink. If you add black, you get like a maroon color. Um, some of you designers might recognize HSL or HSV. There are different ways of writing out color codes. Um, and that's what this refers to, hue, saturation, and light or value. Cool. How are we feeling about the pieces of color? Yeah? Okay? I'm, I'm a teacher, so I tend to do checks for understanding, so you're going to have to like nod your heads every once in a while. Okay. Uh, let's talk about the other half of color, which is vision. So we wouldn't have any concept of color if we didn't have a means of perceiving it. So. Before I was uh, teaching at a code school, I worked in a biology lab, and I also just generally love science, and I'm a strange human, incapable of having normal conversations, so I always bring up something scientific. So this is no exception! Alright, so the way vision works is light is going to enter through the people here. Uh, it gets passed through the lens. Your eyeball actually has a kind of jelly lens inside it, super weird, after you die, it hardens into like a little plasticky thing. Anyway, uh, it uh, projects the image onto your retina. It's this back layer of the eye. Um, the retina is made up of several different cells, including the ganglion cells, bipolar cells, which connect to the rods and cones. The rods and the cones are the really interesting part. This is where vision happens. Um, rods, they detect light and darkness. Um, they work best in lower light conditions, uh, but they don't perceive color, which is why after you turn off the lights, head to the bed, your vision is just like obliterated. 
takes a little bit, but starts to come back. You start to be able to perceive things. There's not a lot of color. Everything's just kind of grayscale. Uh, it's not because the colors aren't there. They still are. The light is still bouncing off of them. Our cone cells just aren't perceiving them. Only the rod cells are working, so you just see in shades of grayscale. Um, those cone cells, they work best in bright light conditions, um, and they detect color. Uh, the way that would work is that we have three different cone cells. Each of them detects a different part of the electromagnetic spectrum, um, and they result in trichromatic color vision. What we uh, understand is like standard color vision. Uh, it's called trichromatic. You can try three, three different types of cones. Uh, I'm going to dive even deeper into science land because I think it's super fascinating. <laughs> um, so each of these cones corresponds to a different part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Specifically, just the visible light portion. So we have what are known as blue cones, or sometimes they're known as um, L cones, or like long cones. They pick up blues, purples, that the longer end of the spectrum. Um, we have green cones, which pick up the middle, the green and yellow hues. And we have red cones, which deal mostly with reds and oranges. Uh, and all three of them together give us this trichromatic color vision. There are actually some people who are reported to have four different types of cones, so they see way more colors than just the standard, more nuance of color than the standard trichromatic vision. Super fascinating. Uh, also, another aside, I'm sorry, I can't help myself. Uh, the electromagnetic light spectrum, uh, light is just one small part of that spectrum. On one end, there's also like microwaves, radio waves, um, we have visible light, and then we have things like gamma rays and stuff like that. So it's all the same radiation, just different wavelengths, different sizes of those waves. Um, but we can only see a small portion of that. I'm like, why? Like, why can't we also see radio waves? It turns out that our sun out there, it's so nice having windows. The school where I work doesn't have, we're in a basement, so I'm not used to windows. So this, I might get distracted at that way. But the light from the sun, it actually, if you look at the electromagnetic spectrum, the light that it outputs, the greatest amount of radiation is in one narrow band, one small band. And that happens to be the visible light portion. So why can we see that on the other sides? Uh, humans are evolved from mostly diurnal, daytime active creatures. Um, I know some of you developers are more nocturnal. <laughs> but in general, we're awake and active during the day. Um, and so it makes sense that uh, our ancestors way, 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 way back would develop the ability to detect that high amounts of radiation along that band that our sun outputs in the most quantities. What? <laughs> I, so I, I got really excited when I was researching light and vision and color. Probably, I'm sorry, but it was very boring for all of you. Uh, okay. We are going to look at, during this talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about different types of color blindness. Um, and we'll come back a little bit why, um, why that's our focus for this talk in a little bit. But first I want to talk about what are the types of uh, different color vision. So uh, this is typical tri trichromatic vision. Uh, we also have protonopia and protonomaly. These are just two types of the same um, color vision. Um, protonopia and protonomaly, uh, they occur when there's atypical functioning in that red cone cell. So protonopia, I like to remember that there's no red cells with the nopias because it's like, are there any red cells? Nopia. <laughs> protonopia. Um, protonomaly is when the red cells are present but um, not all of them function or all of them function uh, to a lesser degree. But it results in this um, Diachromatic vision, or just like this blue and gold. Um, you might have heard of this as red green color blindness. Has anybody here experienced red green color blindness? Yeah, it's very common. Um, Protonopia is the less common version of red green, but it's known as red green because red over here and green are very similar hues with uh, red green color blindness. Um, it's really easy to mix those two up. Uh, we also have Deuter uh, deuteronopia and deuteronomaly, which is actually the most common form of red green color blindness. And this affects estimates are around 8% of white European descended males uh, experience this form of red green color blindness, and it is uh, 
atypical functioning of the green, the green cone. So you can look at the color spectrum along the bottom. They're very similar, a little bit different. Uh, lastly, we have tritinopia and tritinomaly, and this is the malfunctioning of the blue rods, sorry, the blue co the cone, cone cells, um, and they result in this really interesting, I think really lovely uh, vision, color vision. Um, it is, it's very, it's pretty rare, it's like less than 1% of the population. Um, there is a final form of color blindness, uh, which is achromatopsia and achromatomaly, um, super, super rare. This is when all three of the different color cones um, are either not present or um, atypically functioning. Um, and it results in a desaturated or completely grayscale vision. Um, usually this also comes with other, it's comorbid with a few other vision problems as well. But basically the rods are doing all the work. Cone cells aren't contributing a whole lot. Okay, so why are we talking about color blindness? Uh, I want to talk about color with accessibility because I think that color is a really um, easy jumping off point for understanding the ways in which our unconscious biases um, and unconscious ableism on the part of designers and developers can lead to really significant problems for users who are trying to make like easier applications. Uh, so we're going to just use this as a jumping off point instead of talking about all of accessibility at once. Okay. So, really the problems come up when we as designers, when we as developers, when we conflate vision with attention. Like just seeing something on the screen means like you're paying attention to it. It's definitely not the case. Uh, we also kind of tend to conflate attention. So like if something has pulled my attention, it means I must understand it as well. These aren't related to each other. I mean, they're related, but they're not the same thing. Uh, it's our job as designers and developers to make sure that we are doing our due diligence to improve the understanding of our users to use our applications. If we just stop at showing them something or we stop at pulling their attention and we're like, they got it, they're fine, we haven't done our jobs. We need to make sure that our users understand what they're looking at as well. Cool. So let's, let's start with an example. Everyone loves forms. <laughs> This is actually not the worst example I've ever seen because it has labels. Uh, so this is just a dummy form that uh, I built here. It's just a contact form. You put in your name, uh, an email, uh, and a message, and submit. So we're at the point where our user, aka me, uh, has filled this out, tried to submit, but there's an error going on. So uh, if you've got trichromatic color vision, you can see that this field is the problem, the email field, because we have this outline in red. Everything else is green. This is a very common error and confirmation color scheme. Green means you're okay, red means stop, there's something wrong. Uh, but let's look at it if we were experiencing um, due to, uh, protonopia. protonopia. Way harder to distinguish. With this monitor, it, this kind of red color is actually pretty bright, so it's a little bit more visible um, on my screen. Uh, it's the distinguishing colors are very, very close together. It's not impossible to make this work, but it does require a lot more cognitive work on the part of our user. Uh, by the way, the tool I'm using for this is uh, a Chrome extension called I Want to See Like the Color Blind. And color is spelled with a U, because I guess the person making it speaks British English. Um, but it's a very cool extension. It allows you to toggle between different types of um, color blindness. It renders it uh, for trichromatic color users to see what it would be like for someone with different types of color blindness. OK, so let's, uh, if I'm a user, I'm looking at this form, if I can't really if I don't notice this very slight color distinction, I don't know what's going on. Did the page freeze? Is something broken? Did it submit and it just like didn't refresh? Did I do something wrong? Did something go wrong with the site? I don't know. Uh, so if we add in maybe a brief error message, so it's like, hey, please correct the errors. Now I at least I know that I messed up. But even if I have this message, it's still kind of difficult to figure out which of these fields is wrong. Uh, I don't know about you, 
I make mistakes in forms all the time. And it always happens when it's like the kind of form you have to scroll like three times to get to the bottom of. And then whenever I mess up, it's always it kind of like clears out the whole form. Anyway, uh, at least our phone doesn't do that, but it would be nicer if we knew which exact, exactly which field was the issue. So the last thing we can add is a little message telling us, hey, it's your email, please correct the email address. So when I take out color here and don't assume it, then I still have the ability to see which field I need to correct and what I need to correct. Uh, of course, this is still a little bit dull. I would probably use a different color here. It's a little hard to read. But overall, we've added two things, just two things. And it has made a world of difference for a user who can't rely on red green outlines for error messaging. OK. Uh, I don't remember what this means. Let me look at my notes. <laughs> oh my god, I have so much science in here. I should have taken it out. OK. Uh, Okay, so why is this important? Um, so if we think about that summary of the refactor that we did, uh, hopefully, in addition to adding those two small pieces of error messaging, um, hopefully we're also using good ARIA roles and properties and states and things like that. Um, there's a great uh, ARIA property for forms. It's called ARIA invalid, and it literally just attach it whenever you would add an error message to an input field. Just throw in the ARIA invalid tag as well. Super easy, great for screen readers. Um, by adding elements that make our form more usable for uh, users who don't see and try problematic color vision, it also is way easier for just all of our users. Because not only before, I could have seen that, yeah, that field had an error in it, but I wouldn't necessarily know what the error was. And now my message is telling me exactly what I need to correct. Uh, so when we make things better for all users, uh, well, when we make things better for small subsets of users, oftentimes it improves the functionality for all of our users. Okay, great. Uh, I want to take a minute and pause. This doesn't even begin to talk about color in terms of color associations, um, cultural differences of color associations. There's a whole wide of color theory out there that impacts what our colors communicate to our users. Um, if you want to learn more about that, I would recommend a really fantastic talk by Louisa Barrett. Um, it's called The Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle Guide to Color Theory. It's delightful. Um, there's a video, I've got this link, and I'll share my slides out somewhere uh, uh, from Keep Review Weird conference last year. So there's a great talk about color associations. OK, this is all great. Um, but I want to leave you with some actual action items that will allow you to build apps that are more accessible from a color standpoint. Okay. Fortunately, here's some nice, easy tips. Okay, so we want to avoid palettes that are kind of of a similar brightness. So yeah, these hues are all different, but the saturation and the brightness are very, very similar, which I can tell by desaturating them. All these grays, are almost exactly identical. So when I use colors that are like this, um, all these colors close together in an application would result in kind of just a muddy mess. Even if you have perfect trichromatic color vision, it's hard to distinguish what are the, what are the important things, what is not. Um, they're all just kind of the same level. They tend to bleed together. It's not super great. So uh, what you could do is, oh, also, if you're looking at the screen, when I clicked over to the gray squares, did you see some phantom colors? Yeah. yeah. That's because our cone, sorry, more science. Our cone <laughs> cells uh, tend to get depleted. And so after you've been looking at one color for a while, you're exhausting the resources that it takes to transform a photon into an electrical signal. And so after you see it, you see the opposite color because the other cones are more active. <laughs> okay, so uh, how do we fix that? Let's just change it up a little bit. Let's play with the brightness. Let's play with the value. Um, so from this previous muddy one, where they're all kind of similar, um, we can make the red a little bit more bold. We can darken up the blue. We can brighten up the green. And then when I drop the saturation, just to check, just to check how, how muddy these would be together, we can see that our grays pretty different, pretty easy to distinguish. So uh, make sure that you're using, when you have multiple colors, 
make sure you're balancing the different brightnesses and values of those colors. Um, also, please, though, nobody use this color palette in an application because <laughs> it is garbage. Uh, don't do that. That would be a terrible app. No one would use it. Okay. All right. Uh, another tip that I have, um, it's really fun to start with color, especially if you're a designer and you're like, oh my gosh, I have my color, my brand, and the, like, the brand assets file. I can just start there. It's awesome. I would challenge you to build out an entire design with only black and white elements. Like, maybe not even grayscale, maybe just black and white. If you challenge yourself to communicate things explicitly without relying on other visual cues, um, your site will absolutely have like no problems communicating functionality to your users. And then, any color that you add is just simply an enhancement. Maybe just like, pulls attention a little bit better. <laughs> But really critically, you do not want to ever solely rely on color to communicate something. So starting with a like color last design will help you avoid like hinging entire pieces of uh, communication on color alone. Okay, uh, next piece of advice: if you don't know what kind of colors to use, less is more. Stick with one color, one primary color, uh, like this kind of purpley blue here. Um, and to get your palette, just lighten it up in one direction, add some more white to those colors, or add some more darkness. And you'll notice this black, or this dark color, it's not a solid black, it's still kind of a tonal purpley blue. Um, so everything will be meshed together really nicely. Use good contrast for text. Like that. <laughs> There are some really great sites that, uh, so there's the Web Accessibility, no, Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. Um, there, it's basically a written up set of guidelines that have recommendations for making your site, your application, your design, the most accessible. There are people who have, who have built really amazing applications that allow you to input colors and text sizes, text fonts, and it'll analyze it and give you a score telling you how accessible is this. Sometimes what works for one size of font, one color combination, if you shrink that font up, it stops working, it stops being readable. Um, I, there are some really great ones if you just Google like WCAG, color contrast or text contrast checker. Um, lots of great apps out there. Uh, another easy one. Um, contrast is super important, especially if you are using a photo background, which I'm guessing a lot of your designs probably have hero banner, uh, hero images with text over top of it. Uh, make sure you're using some sort of good filter for contrast and readability. Uh, great, what else do we have? Label stuff. This is a transit map. It's nice and colorful and friendly, uh, but I don't know what line to get on. Because all the signs, they just say like, jump on the, the red line from my transfer from the green line. Uh, but looking at this map, I have a hard time distinguishing like, which bit. It's like, where are the, where's the actual connections here? So label things both on the page and also using ARIA labels. So label it where the user can see it and in the code itself. Um, great. Doesn't detract from things. But this is a little bit more readable, less terrifying uh, if I don't have standard like trichromatic color vision. And lastly, use your tools. I mentioned a few, like that Chrome extension, I want to see like the color blind. Um, WCAG has lots of recommendations and tools. Um, and one of the best tools is user testing. You know, it's hard to do, uh, but it doesn't have to be a big formal process. Um, as you're developing, test early, test often. As you're designing, test early, test often. Um, they don't have to be, you know, multi-thousand dollar formal studies, just get your app in front of people, get your designer in front of people who are going to be using your application. Uh, let's see, what else do I have here? Uh, oh, there's a really great guide on Smashing Magazine. Uh, if you look up color accessibility, Smashing Magazine. Uh, I do have a link in the slides, and I'll figure out how to share those, so I'll probably tweet them out later. Um, that has really great points, a little bit more depth than I went into here. Also, I mean, Okay. Uh, I'm at my penultimate slide. Basically, 
color accessibility doesn't you don't have to be a great designer. You don't have to have a great eye for color. All you have to do is just leverage the tools that other people have already built uh, and always, you know, go overkill with explaining things. You can always wind it back. It's hard for add in when it's not there to begin with. So you can do it. You got this. Also, I'm around for any questions that you have. Uh, my name is kind of hard to remember, so if you want to get in contact with me, I only have two business cards with me today. Uh, you can always visit that person from the thing and it routes to my site. Um, you can always email me at lita.turing.io. Always happy to answer any questions, set up meetings, whatever. Um, otherwise, find me on Twitter. Fair warning, I tweet mostly about social justice and also my feelings. So <laughs> if you're not into that, you might want to avoid the follows. Um, but there are also, of course, some science retweets in there too. Um, but color, it, I know it's kind of intimidating, especially if you're not a designer. But these simple things will make it, uh, these tools that you can use, um, means that your apps will be usable. And that's really the point of design, anyway. So, thank you. You can go to lunch at Curly. <laughs>